Thank you, Allison, and thank you, everybody in the room and on, in, on Zoom. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here um, to talk to you about uh, Safari. And um, I've been uh, at Safari for a year and a half now, and I'm going to tell you today about really what we've learned um, in the last 10 years, what, what, uh, um, what Safari's accomplished. Safari's mission... Okay, sorry. Okay, Safari's mission is really to improve the understanding, the diagnosis, and the treatment of autism spectrum by funding research of the highest quality and relevance. Uh, it was founded actually 20 years ago by Jim and Marilyn Simons, and it was founded by bringing people together, scientists together, to ask the question, what kind of research can really make a difference, help us achieve this mission? Um, it was launched in 2016, so um, uh, about 17 years ago, and the annual budget is over $100 million and has three major buckets of activity, convening people, bringing people together to share ideas and to look for oppor new opportunities for research going forward, grant making, so providing grants to individuals to explore that research, and then building incredibly enabling resources. And I want to talk a little bit about how enabling those resources have been. So, you know, for me, thinking back to 2003 at the gathering of scientists to come together to say, how do we improve our understanding of autism and by in, in, do so, in doing so really improve diagnosis and treatment, it's an incredibly complicated human condition with lots of different features and scientists like to have things that they can dig down into so that they can understand the biology, really understand the, the, the meaning and the mechanisms of the condition. So at that time, what was known was that uh, autism is one of the most heritable neuropsychiatric disorders. So studies have shown that in identical twins, if one twin um, has autism, the likelihood of the other also having autism is between 70 and 90 percent for identical twins, about 31 percent for fraternal twins, and it's about 20 percent for siblings. So that says that there is a genetic basis. It also says that there are environmental influences um, on autism. But that was the kind of clue that indicated that a good place to start would be to start to look at what are some of those genes that contribute to autism. And that led the Simons Foundation and Safari to put resources into building very large cohorts of autistic individuals and their families and to do both clinical, get clinical information on those individuals, but to also get genetic information. And the first cohort at the bottom is the Simons Simplex Collection. Um, and that included 2,600 families. They were um, simplex families, so one child with autism, an unaffected sibling, and two unaffected parents. Uh, we also support the autism inpatient collection that's run by uh, Matthew Siegel and co-sponsored uh, by the Nancy Lurie Marks Foundation. And currently also two large um, uh, cohorts, Simon Searchlight, which is a genes first cohort, so individuals with genetic variants that are known to contribute to autism um, are enrolled in that cohort. There are about 180 different groups. Uh, and then Spark, which is a phenotype first, so individuals who have a professional diagnosis of autism sign up for Spark and get genetic and clinical information that's collected, that's then uh, um, uh, made available, importantly, on large uh, open data sets for research so that the entire uh, research community can use that information to really try to gain a deeper understanding. Uh, these types of cohorts have led to the identification of over 100 genes and copy number variation variants that um, contribute to autism. Uh, one of the, and they're shown here on the, on your left here, uh, the Spark gene list. You don't have to read them. There are a number of genes on that list. Uh, but one thing I really want to highlight is that um, those hundreds of genes explain a small percentage of autism. So if you look on the right there at that graph that shows um, the, the red dots are these de novo, they're new uh, variants of genes. 
um, that are extremely rare on the, on the x-axis at the bottom. You can see that in terms of how frequent they are in the population, they're extremely rare, but they actually um, give a relatively large increased um, likelihood of autism. But they're rare, so they don't explain autism in everybody. But there is one really important thing, which is that they are unbelievable tools for neurobiologists to then try to use them to look at some of the biology of autism and to use some of the amazing tools that are now available to really explore the brain. And Allison talked about the potential to do that in human brain, the potential to do that in brains from other model systems, to look at individual cells in the brain that you can label and visualize, um, and to look really using new microscopy methods to look at the level of synapses and how neurons communicate with one another in the brain um, to produce behaviors. So I'm going to just tell you one story today that is from a group of scientists who took genes from the, from the um, Safari gene list and then used them to learn something about biology that's relevant to autism. And that's a story, uh, a research project that was led by Lauren Orofice and um, David Ginty at Harvard Medical School. And this is a group that's been interested in how do we sense touch? How is the sense of touch um, processed in the brain? And if you look, you know, we often think about the brain as just the brain, uh, the central nervous system, but there's also a peripheral nervous system with cells that have their cell bodies in the spinal cord and then reach out. And in the sense of touch, they, they, have, um, they send out processes that go to, you can see here, the hairy skin and the, and the glabrous skin, which is like your fingertips where there's no hair on it. And they have terminals that can sense that um, uh, mechanical stimulation from touch relays it back up to that uh, cell body in the spinal cord and then brought back up to the central nervous system. So that's the science that they've been interested in. And they had the, um, the um, realization that because a very common feature in autism is altered tactile sensitivity, so altered sensitivity to touch, with studies that suggest between 60 and 100% of kids have either hypersensitivity or hyposensitivity. They thought, well, we can use some of those genes perhaps from that Safari gene list and see if we can start to understand a little bit more about the biology of, of touch. And so what they did was they used a mouse model, very common approach to trying to understand some of the biology of human genes. And um, they took mice and they took, in this case, you're seeing three different autism genes that were tested. The two in red are different variants in a single gene that caused that gene to not be expressed. Um, and then the orange and the sort of magenta purple are two other autism genes. And what they did is they knocked those genes out in the mice and then they measured their tactile sensitivity and they compare that to the control in all of those clear bars, and you could see that in every case where the mice expressed that autism gene, there was increased sensitivity to touch. That first experiment that's shown on the left, they knocked out these genes in every neuron in, in the body, but then they said, well, let's use uh, genetic tools that allow us to knock those genes out just in the central nervous system or to knock them out uh, in, those, in the neurons that, that project out to the sensory uh, terminals in the skin. And interestingly, what they found is that when they knocked them out in the, in the brain, in the central nervous system, didn't have any effect. But when they knocked it out in the periphery, now they, they saw this increased hypersensitivity. Um, even cooler was that they thought, well, let's see what happens to other functions. And they took these um, mice that had these genes knocked out just in their peripheral neurons, and they put them in a test that people use to, to sort of model anxiety behaviors in mice. So you put the mouse into what's called an open field. It's a big open field, has an open space in the middle, and it's a measure of how much do mice like to go and explore that open space. If you're anxious as a mouse, 
you hug up against the walls. It's called stigmataxis. You just stay towards the walls. And what they found, if you can see, these are just drawings of where those mice have gone in that large open field space. And in the control, they're exploring the whole space. They're not worried about whether they're in an open environment. They just go all over the place. But when they've knocked out these genes in the sensory um, uh, neurons, they now see this phenotype that suggests that they're very anxious. And what was really interesting is that only happened if they did it early in development. So that suggested that that sense of touch somehow is relayed back to how the central nervous system gets wired and to produce um, behaviors that are like anxiety. Okay, so then what did they do? One of these genes actually encoded a receptor that's on the cell surface. It's a GABA-A receptor, and GABA-A receptors are the targets of benzodiazepines, which most people are quite familiar with. So they gave the mice benzodiazepines to see if that changed their sense of touch. And it did, but it also made them very sleepy. So they really couldn't figure that out very well. But there are using, you know, farm, uh, new drugs. Or there are forms of these drugs that don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So they used one that only stays in the periphery, so you don't get sedated because it's not in, in it doesn't get central nervous system access. And what they found is if they're just blocking those receptors in the terminal uh, sensory neurons, they now, if you can see here on the left, that drug, isoduvacine, they completely reduce that increased tactile sensitivity. But amazingly, they also then reduce that anxiety behavior. So um, now both uh, Lauren and, and David are working with Deerfield, an investment firm, to try to say, how can we identify other, you know, uh, uh, compounds that might work in that peripheral way to change tactile sensitivity. And what I think is really exciting is it's another great opportunity to go back to Spark and say, how, how can we now, for example, in that large cohort that we have, work with scientists? And we just hosted a workshop on how do you measure sensory function in humans so that we can have great measurements to be able to say, if, if there is a clinical trial that's trying to see how particular compounds might reduce that tactile sensitivity and in turn potentially reduce some of the anxiety behaviors, um, we can now go back and do some of that science in Spark. So that's just one story. Um, I've just listed up here, I just went through and picked you know, a handful of other studies that have been done taking different genes that have really started by how do we go from, you know, individuals and human beings and families and identify these genes and then put them into systems where we can really understand what they're doing and then hopefully translate those back into something that's going to make a difference for families. So um, with that, I'm going to stop and happy to answer questions. I want to really say a thank you to Allison and the uh, Autism Science Foundation and an enormous thank you to everybody on the uh, Safari team. Yes, I'm curious. You, know, you pointed out how rare the genes that you did find in the Spark study were, well, I'm curious, relative to all the autistic participants in the Spark study, of which I was one, by the way, I, <clears throat> I'm curious how many of the total autistic population had any of the genes, and full disclosure, I came back as having none of them, so, which is yeah. why I'm curious. Well, you were in the majority. It is about 10% that get results back at this point in time, and a lot of it is how do we really do more science to, uh, to be able to identify those other genetic variants. Hi. This is not meant to be a political question, so I just want to preface it that okay. way. Okay. <laughs> but I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts are about what the future of prenatal genetic counseling might look like. Um, I'm glad you prefaced it by saying it wasn't <laughs> a political question. Because 
because my brain goes in a bunch of different directions. You know, one of it clearly goes with all the changes in sort of reproductive rights um, uh, laws. Uh, I think that that creates a lot of, of questions about how accessible this is. I think that it's, you know, the future of prenatal diag uh, diagnostics, I think it really depends on the way that I think about it is um, really these, these variants that we're showing here in this context, they're not deterministic, right? So I wouldn't want necessarily to even imply that one could take these genes and then make decisions about uh, pregnancies. So I, I, you know, just to put it in the context of, of autism, I wanna make that really, really clear. And I think that a lot of science that we need to do is to try to understand that complexity of gene-gene interactions, gene-environment interactions. Um, so I hope that's a, a reasonable answer. What, what insight do we have to lack of speech or limited speech to so many people with autism? Yeah, well, I'm actually not the best person to answer that question, and I think some of the speakers later today would probably be able to um, address some of that. I think it's a really important question. We had, uh, we just finished three days of, of uh, scientific presentations from the S safari investigators, and there is really interesting work, for example, looking in model systems at, at bird song, where you learn about how, how does a young bird learn language from their, in, the, in that case, in the bird song, it's from the father. Um, and, you know, so I think that those kinds of approaches may shed light on, on some of those questions. All right, well, thank you.